right. Hey, we are starting a brand new series today called Covered. Everybody say Covered. covered. How many of you enjoyed the last series that we just got out of Next Level? Come on, let me hear you if you enjoyed that. Wasn't that good? So we are starting a new one today called Covered. So turn to someone and say, I am covered. Turn to someone else and say, you are covered. Awesome, awesome. Praise the Lord. Well, um, we're going to launch this thing out today, and uh, my, my goal with this series is that um, you understand that, uh, that you are covered by the Lord, and uh, when, when I talk about covering, it's not just protection. There are many ways that God covers you, amen? There's many ways that God surrounds you. There's many ways that God helps you. There's many ways that God provides for you, amen? And so that is what I want to talk about in the next few weeks is under, uh, understanding and discovering the multiple ways that God covers us, amen, and that we know that we have a covering, and uh, so we know that God's got our back, right? Yeah, right? God's got our back, and, and we know that, And uh, but sometimes we go through life, sometimes we go through situations, and we wonder if that's true or not. Am I being, am I being real? We wonder at times, is God really got my back in this? Is he really helping me in this? Is he really in control? Is he really watching over me? And... Um, and I, I know that over the next few weeks, my heart and uh, the agenda, if you will, of this series is for you to obtain the knowledge that in everything, just as we sing today, that he's enough. In every situation, in every circumstance, in everything that we go through, that you know that he's got your back. Amen? Hallelujah. Because I believe that God has a vision to keep you covered. It is his vision to cover you. It is his vision to protect you in more ways than one. It is his vision to watch over you. It is his vision to provide for you. Amen. And there's many different kinds of protection that the Lord provides. And so to understand these principles and to, to access these principles will allow us the understanding and the knowledge to know what God's protection and covering really is about. And so that's what my heart is. That's what the goal is behind this uh, for this series. So turn with me to Matthew chapter chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. We're going to read a pretty familiar uh, story that, that you've probably all heard before a couple times in your life. Matthew chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 5, and we're going to read down through verse 13. Starting in verse 5, reading down through verse 13. It goes like this. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. I will come to him and heal him, he told him. Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be cured. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, I assure you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. Isn't that interesting? I tell you that many will come from the east and west, and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus told the centurion, Go as you have believed. Let it be done for you. And his servant was cured that very moment. Let's pray. Father, speak to us today. Teach us something new. God, ignite something fresh and uh, a newness, God, in our lives today. God, allow us to obtain this word, Father, that you have for us today. Allow us to receive, God, the text, Lord, that has been read, Father, and allow it to unfold and unravel in our life, God, and make it real for us today, God. We're willing to receive. We're willing to learn. We're ready to grow today, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said... Amen. Amen. Now, before we jump into back into all of this, um, and the title of my message, by the way, sorry, I forgot to mention to it. The title of my message this morning is he's got he's got your back. Right. He's got my back. 
And uh, I kind of already mentioned that, but forgot to say that that was the title. I apologize. So before we jump a little bit into this text and kind of um, bring it apart and, and pick it apart here in just a minute, um, I have, I've taught you this before, and I, I know you have this understanding, but you got to remember that Jesus was born in what the Bible says is the fullness of time, right? In the fullness of time, which happened to be during the Roman Empire, right? So the Romans are in charge. They're in control. Jesus was born under this rulership, right? And so here's the Romans in charge, in control, and Jesus shows up. Now the centurion, I can wager uh, to say, had already been watching Jesus amongst the Jews, amongst the Jewish people. He had already been seeing Jesus do certain things amongst the Jewish people. And his response in verse 8 says, I am not worthy that you should come into my house, but only say a word. But only say a word. And this statement, the Bible says, blows Jesus away. It says that Jesus was amazed. Jesus was amazed. Now, I you may know better than I. I'm not I mean, if you know the Bible better, that's great. But tell me any other place in the word where someone did something or someone said something and it completely amazed and astonished Jesus to where he stopped and was like, whoa. That is amazing. I have never seen more faith in my life than that person right there. I don't read anywhere in the Word where we see something as exciting that alerts Jesus, that excites him, that gets him on his toes. I've never seen it up to this point. Now, there may be, I'm not sure. The Bible scholars in the room can let me know later. And catch this in verse 10. Who is the Bible talking about when it says, those following him? Go look at verse 10. Look in your Bible. It says, hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him. Who was the ones that was following him at this point in time? Not the disciples. The multitude. The people that were gathered around him. So who was gathering around him? Who was the multitude? It was the church folks. So he turns to the church folks. And he says to the church folks, I have never seen anyone in all of Israel with more faith than that guy right there. Imagine in that moment what all of those people were thinking. Oh, man, like, I I believe in Jesus. I've seen Jesus do all these things. Like, we've been following Jesus. But, gosh, I don't have near as much faith as that dude right there. I got to check myself. I got to change some things about me, right? And this is important to understand because what Jesus is saying is that he hadn't, hasn't seen a level of faith in any of them that he's witnessing right now in that moment. He says, I haven't, seen any, I haven't seen this kind of faith in any of you guys, but now I'm seeing it in this man that I don't even know that hasn't been following me, that hasn't been seeing everything that's been going on, that hasn't been my disciple or anything like this, but somehow he A Roman official, a Roman soldier has more faith than all of you that have been watching me? And it's really interesting because now this puts the whole story into a different perspective. Now we have this centurion who doesn't necessarily fit with the crowd because he's a Roman who has all of a sudden more faith than everybody else that already believes in Jesus. And how is that? It's crazy. So here's a man who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't have a relationship with the Father, and all he has been doing is watching. All he's been doing is watching. That's it. That's it. Now, you remember, I guess it was, geez, a few months ago when I preached a series, Heaven and Earth. Does everybody remember that? And we talked about, um, and if you missed any of that, I probably feel like that's the best message I've a series that I've ever done and it was just there was so much revelation behind it I believe the Lord was really speaking in that season to us but um, if you haven't heard those messages I want to I want to encourage you to go back and listen to them but I taught that series heaven and earth and I taught you about the garden we went all the way back into the garden remember and we talked about how the the serpent how he entered into the scene and we talked about all those kind of things and remember I told you as the word says remember it says in Genesis that that you are not to eat from the what There we go. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Uh, y'all just said the, the tree. <laughs> like, what tree? <laughs> There's a couple of them there that I mentioned. Um, and so 
we see that Jesus, uh, that the, the Father, God, tells, tells Adam and, and tells him, don't, don't eat of that fruit of that tree, right? Because it says, surely you will die. And then we see how the serpent comes and, and he tricks Eve and Eve eats of it and gives it to Adam and all that. And then the rest is history, right? We, we know the story. But remember I had taught you that, um, that there were two trees, right? The tree of what? Knowledge of good and evil. And then the what? The tree of life. And it says that the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. And remember, when you go back and you break down that word midst, right, it meant that it was in the, it was in the middle. But when you go and you do a further study, you will find that the word actually breaks down to suspended. So we have that tree suspended in the middle of the garden, right? And we know that that was the portal. And I want to encourage you to go back and listen to these messages so you don't get confused on what I'm saying right now. But that was a portal. That was an access way to heaven, right? Because we saw multiple times where God would just show up or he would disappear or whatever may happen, right, throughout that story. And we know that that was, that, that was in the midst. It was hanging there. That was an access way to heaven. And we know that there was the tree of, of, of good and evil, right? And where all of a sudden the serpent entered in right? And, we, and you can go back and you can study how, how that really is a symbolic uh, a tree to show that how you can access hell, basically, right? And you can do things to mess up in your life, and all of a sudden you're looking at a different situation than you would if you're looking up to the tree, right? I broke all of that down and, just, and, and really kind of tried to, to help you understand what the, really the garden story was all about. Again, I want to encourage you to go back so you understand what I'm saying right now. So Adam in the midst of all of that, Adam loses the ability to speak to things, right? We see that Jesus, or excuse me, God gave Adam the ability to speak to a thing, right? And call it by name or to do this and to do that. He gave him the authority to do that. And so all of a sudden after this whole garden scenario has taken place, all of this situation has unfolded, Adam loses his ability to speak to things. And Jesus is, is upon the earth showing us how he intended us us to operate, right? He gave Adam the authority and said, you have the authority to do all of these things. Adam lost the authority by doing the very thing that God told him not to do. So God has to show back up into the garden and take over and take control and to take over the authority that he had already prior, priorly given Adam, right? And so now Adam no longer has the ability to speak to a thing. But we know that every time Jesus speaks, everything obeys, right? Anytime Jesus speaks, everything obeys. So here we have in this gathering, here we have in this story in Matthew chapter 5, all of these religious folks, they're gathered around. These are the church people, so to speak. And they're listening and they're gathered around. They've been following Jesus and they can't understand. They cannot understand what's happening in the moment. But the Roman man in the military is just sitting there. The centurion doesn't know God or the church, but the Bible says he knows authority. What was the one thing that was stripped away from Adam in the garden? Authority. And here is a Roman centurion, years and years and years down the road, Matthew chapter 5, says he doesn't know anything else, but what he does know is he does know authority. He does understand authority. He doesn't know the stories. He doesn't know the Hebrew but the Bible says he's been watching. He's been watching. And he sees that every time Jesus speaks, someone gets healed. Every time Jesus speaks, someone gets set freed. Every time Jesus speaks, something happens, something shifts, something changes, right? And he realizes that every time Jesus talks, that there is a shift and there is a change that takes place. And the thing that escalates his faith, that gives him the ability to believe that Jesus can do anything is Jesus' authority. In that moment, that is what escalates his faith, is tapping into the knowledge and the understanding of what Jesus' authority is really all about. He's been watching Jesus step on every trouble and the authority that he has. And he understands what the church folk don't understand. You see, we're always needing a word or a sign. And Jesus is simply saying, all you need is my authority. All Adam needed in the garden was authority. 
as soon as the authority was lost, as soon as the authority was stripped away, everything changed. Everything fell apart. And we see here, these people are not understanding, they are not obtaining what Jesus is doing in the moment, but here is a man who understands authority, that acknowledges that Jesus is a man of authority, that now can access everything that Jesus is doing because he understands authority. My question to you today is, do you understand the authority of heaven that is over your life? Do you understand that Jesus has the authority over you? But do you also know and do you also understand how to respect, how to honor the authority that is placed over your life? I'm not talking at work. I'm not talking about your parents. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Jesus right now. Do you know how to really respect and honor his authority? And that's a question that we want to say, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, I respect his authority. Well, when he spoke to you last, did you listen and obey? When he led you to do something, did you really follow his voice? Because here's something that we have got to grasp and we got to understand that if we are going to be covered, which we are, and we're going to understand that there is a covering over us, there is a protection over us, that covering and that protection only comes if we can submit to his authority. The second that we pull away from his authority, the second that we put ourselves in charge, is the second that that covering is lifted up off of us. How many of you have been through situations and have been through life scenarios where all of a sudden you no longer gave God control over the situation and you took charge and you took control and you stepped in in God's place? What happened? Nothing good. It all fell apart for you, right? Because any time that you step into the place of authority that doesn't belong to you, that's his, that covering will be lifted off of you. And so many times people are like, I don't understand why I keep getting attacked or this or that. It's like, well, do you you honor and respect the Lord? Because if you would honor and respect his authority, then his hand of protection would be around you. Amen? It would be on top of you. And that is something that we have got to understand as believers. It could seem elementary, but oftentimes it's not because we like to step into the place of the Savior. And it was never intended to be that way. So, there are two foundational ways that God's got your back that I want to give you today. I want to teach you this real quick. And then we'll move on from here. Two foundational ways that God's got your back. Number one is this. You have the help you need. No, it sounds basic. But you have the help you need. Psalms 121 says this. We all know this, right? Where does my help come from? My help comes from who? The Lord, right? Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Listen, church, there's never been a time when I called upon the Lord and he didn't help me. Tell me the last time you called upon the Lord and he chose not to help you. He is the one that helps us, amen, because we're covered by him, amen. He wants to help us. He wants to to help us through situations and to help us through trying times. There have been times that the Lord was helping me and I didn't know that he was helping me. Right? Come on, how many of you can speak to that? Where the Lord was trying to step in and help you, but you didn't even know that he was trying to help you. And you're saying, God, where are you? And he's saying, hello, do you not see what I'm doing? Right? There are often times when that happens. There are always, there are, excuse me, there are also times when God is helping you and you don't even know that he's helping you until after it's all said and done. And then you look back and you're like, wow, now I see that God was helping me through that, right? We've all been through situations like that. We all know that God is the one that helps us. Turn to your neighbor and say, I love you, but you can't help me with my trouble like Jesus can. Turn to someone else and say, I love you, but you can't help me with my trouble like Jesus can. Church, if he helped you last time, he'll help you this time. Amen? If he helped you last year, he's going to help you this year. And he helped you through that last situation, he's going to help you through this situation. Amen? And listen, if he's helping you right now through this situation, guess what? He's going to help you in the next one too. Amen? Because that is what he is. That is who he is. He is our helper. Hear me today. Quit calling and looking to everyone else and start turning your eyes in the right direction. 
How many of us, our first response is to go to someone else and dump out all of our issues rather than going to God first? I know that's not you. That's not you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not you. But it's true. Think about it. How many of us would rather tell everybody else about our problem before we tell God about our problem? How many of us would rather go to someone else and ask for help in our problem rather than going to God and saying, I know you're the one that can help me? Let's take it a whole other step further. How many of us go on Facebook and tell everybody about our problem expecting Facebook to help our problem instead of going to God first and asking him for help? Amen? I did say it again. I know. I said it again. You see, you've got to learn where to go when you're in trouble. You have got to learn what direction to go in when you are in trouble. You have got to know who to turn to when you're in trouble. You have got to know who to speak to when you're in trouble. Amen? And we have the authority of heaven on our side, and we have a covering over us. And it is so important that we go to the Father before we go to anybody else. But so many times we get that switched, we get that reversed, where we just, man, man I got, I'm going to call so-and-so right now and tell them what that person said and how that's affecting me and, and what this kind of mess is all about right now. I'm, I'm going to just call them up right now. I'm going to tell them all about it. And God's up there is like, what about me? You think they're going to help you in a way that I can't? You think that they have an answer to your problem in a way that I can't provide? You've got to know where your help comes from. Psalms 121 says, where does my help come from? It does not say my help comes from my best friend. It does not say my help comes from my pastor. Sorry. It does not say any of those things. It says my help comes from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord. Did Jesus go to the centurion? No. No. Jesus didn't go to the centurion. The centurion went to Jesus. And because the centurion chose to go to Jesus, we now can read at the end of verse 13 that the servant was made, was made well. He was cured out of the centurion's knowledge of authority to go to the person in authority first and take care of the situation. You see, like, we go through situations all the time where we just want to overstep everybody else and, and, and try to tell them how it is and do this and do that, right? And it, the Bible says if you have a problem with someone, you go to them first. And if you can't fix it with them, then you take it to the authority, right? But in our life, in our situations, and in our circumstances with the covering God over us, we go to the Father first, We say, God, I need your help in this right now. And God will always provide an answer, and he will always provide help for you. We know that. If you've got a problem with someone, if someone said something to you, you go to the Father and say, God, you know the situation. You know what's wrong. Now help me when I go and engage them. Help me when I go to talk to them that there's peace, that there's understanding, that there's clarity. And God will help you through all of that. He really will. He'll do it every single time. Even the unbelievers know who to go to. And this particular Roman calls Jesus Lord. Even the unbelievers know who to go to. Listen, church, when you know who you have access to, you'll always know who has access to help you. I'm going to say it again. When you know who you have access to, you'll always know Who has access to help you? And who is that church? Jesus. Amen? That's Jesus. So two foundational ways that God's got your back. Number one, you have the help you need. And number two, we've been talking about it already this morning. Number two, you've been given authority. You've been given authority. So not only do we understand that he is in authority, that we have a covering over him because he's in authority over us. But also you need to understand today that you've been given authority. Amen? The goal of Jesus was not just to get you to heaven. 
We know that salvation is real. We know that that is what this thing is all about, but that's not just the primary goal. The primary goal was not just to get you to heaven, but was also to reestablish your authority on earth. Jesus came. Jesus came to save you, but he also came to give you, to give you authority upon this earth. Amen? There are plenty of scriptures that we can read about that. There's nothing like taking the culture of heaven and imparting it into the earth, right? There's nothing like understanding the authority of heaven and implementing that and using that and walking in that in our daily lives here upon the earth. Do you know that God has given you the authority? Do you really understand that? God has given you the authority, the Bible says, to step on serpents, to step on scorpions. That's what the Bible says. Now, what does that mean? Not necessarily for you to take off your shoes and, okay, I'm going to go step on a scorpion. Hopefully not, I won't get stung. No, that's not what that means. It was symbolic that he has given you the authority to step on anything that can come against you, to step on anything that can harm you, can, to step on anything that can attack you. You have, been the, you have been given that authority, amen? You have been given that authority in Christ Jesus, and you need to know that. So when someone is coming against you, you need to understand that you have the authority to put a stop to whatever attack is coming your way, amen? You have that ability. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, and nothing can harm you. That's what it says in the Word. All authority has been given to me, and nothing can harm you. Nothing can harm you. Nothing can come against you. You see, no authority will always equal no power. No authority will always equal no power. No power. I'm going to kind of shift things here, so follow me. We have, coming into adulthood, the most authority-less, if that's a word, the most authority-less generation of all time, coming into adulthood right now. We have a lot of older generations that point the finger at younger generations, right? We see that all the time. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard how horrible the millennials are from not millennials, but from people that aren't millennials, right? And it's like, it's always like, dang millennials, and this and that, and this and that. Well, who taught the millennials to be the way they are? What example were they following? I'm tired of it. I'm tired of being accused of the ones that are taking this world and this country to hell. I'm tired of it. But I also understand that there is some truth behind it. I also understand that right now we have the most authority-less generation of all time rising up where kids can get by disrespecting their parents and their parents do nothing about it. Where, where you can go into a school and a student can tell a teacher off and the teacher can't do nothing about it. I have, I, I'm on TikTok, and I, I follow really interesting things on TikTok, and I have seen these things about, like, what happens inside of school classrooms, and I have seen, I have seen these things of how, like, students will all of a sudden start verbally abusing and attacking teachers, and they can't do nothing about it. The teachers just have to sit there and receive whatever they're saying and whatever they're doing. The teachers don't have the ability to fight back. If a student hits a teacher, a teacher can't do nothing in return. And how is it that we've gotten to the fact that a student is even allowed to get that far? How is it that we've even gotten to the point in, all, in, in history where all of a sudden young people can tell, tell wiser people or older people or people in authority what to do? How is it that we have allowed that? How is it that we have gotten to this place where authority has become completely twisted and completely tainted, where the children are in charge of the household rather than the parents? How is it that we've gotten things so messed up? We've lost control of our schools. We've lost control of our own kids and our own households. We've lost control of so many things. Listen, no wonder your kids don't listen to you. It's because you don't understand authority either. I know that hurt. I know that hurt. But it's the truth. You can't, you can't 
expect them to submit to authority if all they see is you not submitting to authority. You can't expect them to, to, to understand what submission to authority is all about and, and all that kind of thing if they can't see it in you first. If, the, if you come home and all you do is talk about how horrible your boss is and, how, and disrespect them all the time, no wonder they go to their school and disrespect their teacher because mom and dad get away with it. So therefore, I can get away with it too. Come on, church, think about this. We have an issue going on. We have a problem. We have a problem with authority. And we like to step on the toes of our authority as much as we can. We, we do. That is kind of how things have become. And listen, because when there is an absence of authority, you have an absence of power. When there's no authority, there's no power. In other words, Jesse, if you come up to me right now, if you came up to this stage and you tried to overtake me and overpower me, I know you're stronger than me. I know that. I know your muscles are sticking out of your shirt right now. I get that. All right? You're a strong man. If you tried to come up to this stage and overtake me, well, first of all, I would hope that all my other friends would come up here and <laughs> Jalen, that's right, Jordan, thank you, yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is just an example, but Jesse, if you tried to come up here and overtake me, if you tried to take me out, the first thing that you have got to understand is that there's going to be a fight that's in me too, Right? I might not be as strong as you. I might not be able to defeat you, but you better know I'm going to land a few punches. You better know it. There's going to be some sort of resistance that comes to the attack against me because I am not going to allow myself to be beat up and thrown to the ground and destroyed, not because everyone else is present in the room. I don't want to be beat up. <laughs> There's going to be something that rises up in me that fights back and resists to what Jesse is trying to do to me, right? There's going to be something that comes up. But, and I will, I will do some sort of resistance. I might not be successful, Jesse. You might overtake me. But there will be some sort of resistance that comes my way. But... Jesse, if you were half my size, and you were skinny, and you were little, and you overtook me, if you were little, Jesse, and you over, if you tried to come up here and overtake me, but here's the difference. If this time you have a badge on your chest, I ain't going to try to resist. I ain't going to try to fight back. I ain't going to try to put my hands back up and, and try, to, try to hit you or try to take you down. Why? Because there is a difference between, Jesse, you coming up here and trying to overtake me versus, versus you having a badge on your chest that shows me that you have authority that gives you the power, if I have done something wrong, that gives you the power to put a stop to what I have done and eliminate me as a situation I'm now not going to resist because I understand who you are, right? Why is that? Because the badge tells me you have authority. The badge tells me that I must submit to the authority because if I don't, the authority has the ability to call in more power, <laughs> And if I try to fight the authority, before I know it, it's not going to be me against Jesse. It's going to be me against Jesse and this person and this person and this person. And all of a sudden, I am going to be overtaken by a mob of people with a badge on, right? Because that's the way it works. He has the ability, as a person of authority, to call forth more power. You see, some of you 
are fighting battles that you're not designed to fight. Why is that? Because you haven't recognized that the battle belongs to the Lord and he has the final say and you have yet to recognize that the authority has been given to you in all of heaven and all of earth to trample over anything that comes your way. How many of us get attacked left and right? Left and right. Come on, can we be real? There's things that we go through and we get attacked left and right. And we allow the enemy to have a foothold in our life because we don't understand the authority that we walk in in Christ Jesus. Listen, as soon as something comes my way, I say, in Jesus' name, I rebuke that right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. You literally have got to do that. When sickness tries to come over your body, you have got to rebuke that and curse it immediately right there on the spot. Or else that symptom is going to turn into a sickness. It's the same way in everything else in life. When you don't understand that you have been given authority, and when you don't understand that you can walk in the authority of heaven, everything that can come against you will come against you, but it will also overtake you. But when you recognize the fact that you have got the authority of heaven, I have got the badge that shows me and everybody else that I have been given the authority of heaven to stop and to trample anything that comes my way. When you understand that that is where you belong, everything will shift in your life. And you will really understand that you are covered by the Father. Because you tap into his authority. It's not that you are better than anybody else. He has given you that. He has given you the access to his authority. And we need to understand that as believers, we walk in true, the, true authority of heaven. Amen? We walk in the true authority of heaven. There are so many times when things will happen and we'll make mistakes. I get it. And we'll fall short. We know that. But man, there are times in my life where I can look back and I can say, I really wish I would have taken authority in that. Because think, excuse me, things would have been completely different. Things would have been completely different when that coworker was coming against you and attacking you and saying all these things instead of just, oh, I'm just gonna let them say it. No, you take authority, right? Like how many of us? So many times we we step back rather than stepping up. And as believers, we don't have to deal with the junk. That's the nice word for it. We don't have to deal with the junk of the world and what the world tries to throw at us. We can step into a place of authority and come against anything that the, that the enemy is trying to throw against us. And this is the first step to understanding that you are covered. Now, you're probably thinking at the beginning, ooh, I'm covered. This is good. He's going to teach me about how God's protecting me and this and that. No, no, no. He will do that. He'll protect you. You will be covered. But you got to first, before we go a whole other step further, you have got to first understand that he's in, he's in control. He's in charge. He has the authority. But he has also given you the authority. And when you can walk in the authority of heaven, you will walk as a covered believer. Amen? A covered believer. Hallelujah. If only you would tap into the authority of heaven that's already been given to you. If only you would. Stand to your feet with me today. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope the Lord spoke to you through today's message. If you have any prayer need or praise reports, please send us an email at cotcdfw at gmail.com. Please like and share this message so we can reach as many people as possible. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you soon.